Welcome back to Love, Life, and Legacy, the podcast dedicated to helping you navigate these hypersexualized times. And in today's episode, I have a dear friend, a kindred spirit of sorts. His name is David Young. He and I have known each other for many years. And so I've had the privilege of watching his journey personally, and we've always stayed in touch throughout the years. But professionally, he's become kind of like a ninja, where he has sharpened his sword every single day, and he knows how to cut down a tree with one cut. He just knows his stuff. He knows how, he knows how things work and, and why things work the way that they do. And so in today's episode, we're talking about the nervous system. And I really want you to listen to the full entire episode. I don't know if you do. Do you listen to the full episodes? Do you just, do you like Sammy listen to it at quadruple speed? <laughs> like, like a maniac? Well, I'd love to hear what your listening habits are. But for this one, it is, we get into a lot of detail. It's over an hour. You know, typically we keep it under an hour. This one's over an hour. And here's why. The nervous system, if you can understand how to work with it and understand what it's trying to tell you, will help you process your emotions, will help you understand your emotions, and will help you to grow as an individual so that you can take care of other people in your life. If you never understand your nervous system, you will always be confounded by the world around you and you will be at the mercy of your emotions. They will take control. So your nervous system is fundamentally, you can talk about the nervous system from many different perspectives. We're talking about it from an emotional, predominantly emotional perspective. And this is so important on your road to sexual integrity because your spirit seems like the uh, immaterial version of the nervous system. And it speaks to you through your nervous system. Ever get goosebumps when you think of something scary or when you feel the, the presence of a spirit or something like that? Well, guess that that's your nervous system. So somehow your spirit connects to us through our nervous, it's like, it's wild, man. But more importantly and practically, I guess, um, if, you, if you can really process your emotions well, then there's nothing that will stop you. And you will absolutely stop watching porn and stop wasting your time ignoring your emotions or running away from your emotions because you'll be able to deal with your emotions. And we get into a lot of detail about how to do exactly that. So please, by golly gosh, and I'm using that term a lot these days, I must be getting old. Listen to this episode in its entirety and you will be that much more prepared to deal with whatever comes your way. So let's get into it. All right. Let's see if I can so yeah, just basically, I really uh, I don't think many people understand their nervous system. I think most people don't know how to listen to their bodies at all. Um, they don't speak the language of their bodies, and they they miss a lot of vital cues. So they're like deaf, dumb, and blind to the body that they exist in. And because of that, they make a lot of bad choices. So I just wanted to help uncode that. Obviously, um, guiding people towards understanding sexual integrity is a part of that, right? It's just like you're so numb from everything else that you need this super stimulus and to just like feel something because you haven't been listening. Anyway, I'd mm -hmm. love to see if we can go there. But just generally, I'd love for people to have an awareness of the nervous system. And I, I can't talk on it because I don't know, like you know. So you can yeah, this yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I think you can like, feel free to contextualize it so it feels like we're speaking to your audience. I'm, I'm wondering, like, if I were to imagine a couple of people that would probably be listening to this, I'm wondering who are the kind of people. Like, if there's real people, you can change their names. Like, who, when you when you think about your podcast listeners, who's someone who's like, yeah, this person listens regularly. This is the kind of person who's listening. I know you might have like 20 different kinds of people, but right now, who it's I have in my me. mind is like a whoever Gene Honeycutt used to be. Or, <laughs> or it's like some guy in his like mid sixties who loves high noon and loves what they're doing and appreciates that kind of work. Or like the Japanese dad. He doesn't who's... listen to a podcast. He doesn't listen to a podcast. Uh, no, it's like young adults and then Pierre and his crew, you right. know, uh, mostly I'd say young adults. But when we look at the, the monthly stats, 
it's they don't listen to the latest one people listen to like i need i need an answer to this question Mm -hmm. Um, and so they'll sift through our episodes and like get what they want in that moment you know gotcha a la carte so when we release something it's not like everybody flocks to that it's really people come in their own time and so this is more i don't know the if you could boil it down to kind of like a statement the topic is like how to listen to your body or what's an outcome even from that if you listen to your body what happens Mm -hmm. no that was a question oh like if you listen to your body (laughs) what happens yeah the other thing i think the thing is your body is always talking so you can start to hear the conversation that's already going on anyway like there's already a conversation happening decisions are being made but if you're not listening to your body and listening to that conversation then you're not able to participate in it so a bunch of stuff is happening basically without your awareness and you're not able to interrupt things that you might want to interrupt um so a lot of people are like they're chronically stressed or you're chronically depressed or you're and you go through these modes of like procrastinating for a long amount of time and you have this burst of productivity and then you completely shut down most people think that's just what they're doing but actually there's a whole layer of communication happening in your nervous system and in your body there's a reason for that happening and meanwhile you might have like it's not healthy to live like that for a very long time and we try to interrupt it in our brain but the most of that communication is not happening in your thoughts you can't think your way out of a nervous system issue just like you can't think your way out of a feeling you also can't think your way out of a pattern of feeling like you can't think your way out of wait, depression wait, 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 wait. this is all stuff that i want people to hear <clears throat> oh okay great are we recording already <laughs> okay we have but we didn't start <clears throat> yeah i'll get it yeah, okay, like, me... yeah and anyway, i could talk about this stuff all day but yeah well that's the point yeah. I want to capture the good stuff. Um, I'll just do the intro later. I was doing. Okay. Do you need like a bio and stuff later on? Do you want? I can give it to you if you want to sure. use it. I'm sure People you have a lot of uh, acronyms. Uh, yeah. Know, one of my C M M C M M T M A. I guess I'm like a MFT in training, marriage and family therapist in training. Also like a. <laughs> collective trauma integration so ctif collective trauma integration facilitator but it yeah. depends who i'm talking to some people don't want to hear a bunch of acronyms after your name i just say i'm david It'd be nice to say otherwise you're just my buddy right yeah okay um all right everybody so here's the deal this guy i'm gonna put it out there as one of my best friends I I tested the waters. I tested the waters in a group of people, in a crowd, and I and I said that he was my best friend. And he politely declined the offer. <laughs> so now I just say one of, one of, just to be safe. Uh, but he's a long, you know, high noon wouldn't exist really, not the way it is, especially if if it weren't for this guy, because I got the job because of you. Um, so you can either thank or curse David for putting me in this position. Um, but yeah, we've been, ha- you know, you and I have had a very competitive relationship in the beginning of our relationship where we wanted to be the alpha beta male. <laughs> the alpha beta male where like soft, but like <clears throat> quietly in charge. Um, but we've known each other a long time. 10 years. 12 years. I would say 12 yeah. years. Yeah, it's all about 12 years, yeah. Holy moly. So, first of all, as my friend, welcome. And also as a genius, welcome. Welcome to the <laughs> show. It's not a show. We never call it a show. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, man. It's good to be here. It's just so, like, uh, it's cool to see you and nice to be here in this work capacity because we talk so much about this kind of stuff outside of this context. And it's really great to be here uh, in this yeah. context and, like, to be with the people that you're serving and to be with the people at High News serving. So yeah, thanks for having me. Another fun fact is David and I have spent, I don't know cumulatively, but I would I would wager thousands of hours put into WhatsApp uh, back and forth. Like I'm talking regular, average 18 minute messages, something like that. We, I learned, either from you sending me a long message or me sending you a long message, 
what the capacity of WhatsApp is <laughs> because it'll cut you off after a 30 minute message. It says, okay, 30 minutes, just call the guy, right? But uh, yeah, we, we have a long standing WhatsApp communication, but this is new for us to actually speak to each other live because we update each other a lot about our lives, but we we're always in kind of different time zones. So this is cool. This is new yeah, for so us weird. to actually have face to face. <clears throat> Yeah, it's like meeting your pen pal face to face and you've been like sending these like long <laughs> tomes of like written audio or how you guys have been doing for a long time and then you finally get to see them again, yeah. 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 Pen pal, whatever this digital version of pen yeah. pal Do people is. know what pen pals are anymore? Do like, am I dating myself when I say? Yeah, pen there pen used to be these things pen called pen pens and then people would write with them and then they'd write to people in other continents. You could, you would find them in, in through your school or somehow you'd get matched up through some service and they'd be in another land and you try to communicate a lot of times because they were trying to learn your language or there are many different reasons, but you're just buddies who would write to each other and maybe never meet. It's just, it was a really cool thing that existed. Like imagine a random email, you start this relationship, but you actually write it out on a piece of paper. So it was super exciting to get those things in the mail. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. Cause like usually when like when friends, like, cause we don't live in the same place and we don't see each other as much as we used to. And it's like, it's, I'm really grateful that we can kind of like still cultivate probably like one of the deepest friendships I've able to be able to cultivate long distance in this way over all yeah. these years. And like to be able to have, to be able to have a best friend in this kind of context is really, yeah. Yeah. yeah if you guys want to know the quality of your friendship with somebody, when they <clears throat> leave a WhatsApp message and it's over 20 minutes, um, if you listen to that, it means that you love them <laughs> like a friend. If, if you can never find the time, you might just want to ask them to stick to texting or something. So anyway, David's here, but he's not here to buddy it up with me, to, to yuck it up and to, to just goof around like he always does. He's such a goofball, always cracking wise and whatnot. He's here. To put on his serious man bun, I just got a shot of that. Man bun. <laughs> he's uh, he's also really accredited at helping people in many different modalities. He's kind of like the official version of me, and uh, I really wanted to unpack nervous systems because we're dealing with a lot of times people's psychology people's emotions, people's spirituality, but that's all housed in the body and people don't understand how to speak the language of the body. So I wanted to figure out how to make this as simple as possible and understandable as possible. What is the nervous system? So let's just start with that question right there. Like, Please break it down because I think that could get very esoteric or on the polar opposite end, way too pedantic with like, you know, facts about neurons and receptors and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, we could go into neurons and receptors and that kind of thing. But I think <clears throat> basic thing, your nervous system is the information highway for your brain and your brainstem. It is literally how your body and your brain communicates with the outside world. So <clears throat> your nervous system consists of, if you've ever seen a picture in school, that's a picture of your brain and your brainstem, and then a bunch of little roots and tendrils extending into literally every part of your body. So your eyeballs into your heart, into your left toe, your nervous system is extending throughout enti your entire body. And um, <clears throat> it's taking in sensory information and it's sending out motor information. And without having to go back to biology class, basically what it's doing is it's a communication highway. So. Think about like the temperature of the air around your body as you're listening to this episode. How do you how does how do you know the temperature of the air? That's your nervous system. Your nervous system is has cell has receptors on the surface of your skin, and it takes in that temperature, sends it to your spinal column and up into your brain, and tells your brain that this is the temperature of the air around you. And your brain sends back co-regulating concoction of like hormones to regulate your internal body temperature to keep you a certain temperature in the air and that's happening whether you know it or not but as i'm talking about it you might be feeling the temperature of the air more now yeah. does that mean that you're that you only are now feeling the temperature of the air or that your body has always been feeling it the entire time and you're just aware that you're in tune with that temperature so it's like it's a communication highway and the communication of like air on the surface of your skin 
to your brain and spinal column was happening anyway. But did you hear that communication? Are you aware of that communication? Mm. And now imagine that times a <clears throat> hundred thousand. So it's not just the temperature outside of your body. What about like your heart beating? Like, if you notice that you can feel your heart beating, your digestive system is constantly like, crunching, pressing, squeezing, uh, the blinking of your eyes, also like where your body is in your chair, or if you're driving or if you're moving, your body is taking in hundreds of thousands of like data input all the time. And your brain is processing that data input and then reacting to it constantly. And most of life is actually happening there. We think that life is happening in our heads with our thoughts, but the majority of the data input is happening through your body. And the communication highway for that data input is your nervous system. And so I think it's people need to get that there's a, your nervous system is really regulating most of your life, not your thoughts. And in fact, your nervous system is probably responsible for more of your thoughts than we realize. Well, we got to unpack that. So let's bookmark that because I want to understand how that is possible, that your nervous system can regulate your thoughts. And then, but I also want to understand, so it seems like all these little passages, these kind of, you know, you're getting these signals, they're all like little streams that are going to a main super river, which is your spinal column. Is that what you're saying? And that sends the information to your brain. Does everything has to have to pass through the spinal column? Um, no, it doesn't always have to pass through your spinal column. Some things go directly to your brain. Um, some things go to your spinal column. Like, so like your, when I said that earlier, your left toe, that doesn't have like a necessary, you'd have a necessarily direct connection to your brain, but it's also important to get that these are electrical signals and they're happening instantaneously. It's not like a, it's not dial up internet. I mean, this is instantaneous communication and a constant firing of electrical signals between your brain and brain stem and the rest of your body. So it's not like, mm. oh, it's going to have to go to my brain. This is going to take so long to work its way all the way up to my brain. It's like, no, this is happening pretty instantaneously. It's like your, your body is one of the most advanced biocomputers ever that has taken millions and millions of years to evolve into. Your body mm. isn't just 20, 30, 80 years old. Your body is a long project on the planet and it is a very complex functioning supercomputer. Okay. And so you got to help me understand. So obviously that makes sense for, let's say you get, you step on something and it's sharp and then you're like, wow, that's sharp. That's, that's obvious, right? That's your nervous system sending signals that are very clear. Owl, pain, foot, got it. But what's something maybe a little bit more esoteric because we're getting, you're saying all these inputs, okay, the air, that's kind of next level because it's something we can't really see, but we can definitely feel, right? Is there anything else that would fit into that category that I can feel it and I can process it? Kind of like when you when you get goosebumps, like what what is like, what? Is this, is that the nervous system? Yeah. Yeah, of course, because your nervous system is also taking an in emotional input. Like what are emotions? So like a lot of, like I think say the air around your skin. Another thing I could say is your close relationships. So if you're growing up as a child and you all of a sudden get extremely angry and start throwing a temper, temper tantrum and your dad comes into the room or a parent comes into the room and they say, stop that, quit getting angry. And then you know, and then your body immediately freezes up. You get very scared and you decide to stop being so angry. And then every time you get angry, you also get scared that your dad's coming in the room. Now, <clears throat> your dad hasn't had any physical contact with you. Of course, the situation would be like exacerbated if there's physical abuse. Um, but what's happening in your nervous system when you're getting angry? You know, when that happens, like where, where is anger in, in, you know, it was not happening next to you to your right or outside of your head. Anger and all emotional responses are happening inside of your body. That's how you know that you feel angry in the first place because you can feel it. So there might be like an upregulation in your body temperature. You might notice a sensation across your chest. Maybe you get tense in your shoulders and maybe your pupils start to dilate. <clears throat> and that's like actually is data that your body needs to process. Usually anger is the ability to say no. 
that's a very emotions are a very very strong and important evolutionary response to life i need to be able to trust my gut and like especially like my primitive ancestors they're living out in the wild how are they making decisions they need to know like as soon as something is dangerous that emotional response has factored hundreds of thousands of data inputs and gives you a clear signal anger run or anger fight and i can do something with that versus like oh my stomach's a little bit tight my shoulders a little bit tense your, your brain doesn't know what to do with that information but it can do something with you're angry <clears throat> and so that's a very strong emotional drive that's how's and how's your body communicating all that <clears throat> data and synthesizing it <clears throat> it's through your nervous system and then so now you get angry but then your dad comes in <clears throat> and says stop it don't get angry And so, especially as children, we call this like the, the battle between attachment and authenticity. So as a child, as human beings, we're pretty weak as children. We can't feed ourselves. We can barely move by ourselves. If we don't attach to a caregiver, like an adult caregiver, we're done. We're going to die. And so the need to attach to an adult caregiver as a growing, developing human being for the first 12, 13 and years of our lives all the way up maybe people say until like you're 18 25 is a survival mechanism if i can't get this caregiver this adult to take care of me emotionally i'm done and so it isn't a question of like do my you know my do my parents like me or not like me if they don't like me i'm gonna die as a child like they don't want to take care of me so if i have to choose between honoring how angry i feel because something happened to me versus like attaching, getting my dad to keep taking care of me, I'm always gonna choose to attach. So I'm gonna immediately shut down my anger response. I'm gonna start feeling a bit of fear to help remind me to like cower down a little bit so that I'm safe with this adult that seems scary to me. And that's all happening in my nervous system. That's a huge like <clears throat> data transfer process. They said like, if A, then B, then C, then D. And your nervous system is kind of like a muscle. And so as children, let's say that happens hundreds of times. Every time you get angry, your dad's like, don't do that. And it becomes just well known that I don't get angry. Like people don't get angry in this house. And so I learned that at like in my nervous system, exercise that like a muscle. And so whenever now, even if my dad's not there, as soon as I get angry, I immediately start to get scared and suppress that anger. It's like an old communication path where people say it's like a pattern in your mind, but a pattern of behavior and thoughts, but that pattern lives at a sensational level of sensory motor communication in your nervous system. And that's why you can't just outthink your way. You can't think your way out of chronic fear, or you can't think your way out of, oh, I just need to learn how to express myself. That's not, you can't think your way out of that because it's not happening in your thoughts. It's happening in your nervous system, in your body. So it's stored <clears throat> in your body. Your body remembers. Is that, is that accurate? Right. And it's not like, oh, the thought, if I get angry, then I need to get scared is somehow, you know, saved like a floppy disk. Oh, geez, we don't have floppy disks anymore. It's saved like a <laughs> USB hard drive or like it's downloaded into your body memory. That's not what's stored. It's the sensory information. <clears throat> so let's say if I get angry, my shoulders tense, I get hot, my pupils dilate, and I start to become hyper aware of the room around me. You know, and maybe I also remember whenever I see like a figure of authority. So those are like the indicators, like the sensory information that my nervous system takes in. It doesn't take in when I get angry. It takes in any of that kind of situation. And then it triggers a whole set of other sent motor responses. So then I get afraid. So maybe like I start to freeze up a little bit. My chest gets cold and I feel my stomach tighten in a knot. That is a pattern of sensory repetition that I've entrained myself into. I could say, oh, I, my body remembers the anger and the fear, but what's really happening is that my body remembers those sensations and it has a way of dealing with those sensations really quickly, subconsciously, anytime it happens. So then even as an adult, my dad's not there anymore, but I avoid any kind of angry authority figure at all. And whenever I get angry inside of myself at a workplace, I have a difficult time saying no. I might have a difficult time setting boundaries in relationships. So I kind of say yes to things that I don't really want to say. And all of that, if I'm not in touch with my nervous system, I don't feel any of that. Like it's all, it's all below, like I say, it's all happening in my quote unquote subconscious, but it's not subconscious. It's happening in your nervous system. If you get in touch with your body, you can feel that happening. But most people don't know what 
they don't know this. What is your state called anxiety or what is your state called anger? What does your body actually feel like in these states? We only notice like afterwards, like we get back from work and we had a tense conversation with our boss and it's only later on that we realize, yeah, that was really rough or that was really hard. <clears throat> but what is it was really rough or it was really hard. Let's break that down into the different sensory stimuli and responses that were happening in your nervous system and then see if you can actually feel it to recognize what that is. And if you can feel it, then you can start to do something different, but you have to change it from your body. So that's why we would say it isn't like the, <clears throat> the memory is stored in your body. It's the whole sequence of events that is linked to, yeah, the memory. So the memory of like a big authority figure, the memory of feeling small as a child, um, the memory of like not having full language capacities, and so like those are all indicators that were happening at the same time, but that's more like data inputs that your nervous system was taking in at the time, along with what's happening in your body in those moments. <clears throat> and so it's almost yeah. like you th we think that it's the picture on our computer screen, but actually it's all the pixels. It's all the pixels that are coming in, though that's what's really happening. And your body remembers all of the pixels. And if you think that it's the image, there isn't really an image on a computer screen. They're really just pixels. You can't, if you try to just change an image, you can't change an image, but you can change the pixels or the zeros and ones underneath the hood. And that's readily accessible to us, but most people don't receive any training to feel their body and to feel mm -hmm. what's going on and notice, oh, I'm having a like nervous system trigger response, or right? my nervous system is activated right now. This is what it feels like. I know what to do. Sure. It's mostly just unconscious, subconscious. So let me give you some real, because these are very common in the people who are working with us, right? That um, life is overwhelming. They, they have a sense of overwhelm, like a lack of control. Uh, Let's say their parents are just really, they're not getting along with their parents and they don't have the money they want or whatever. They're just feeling kind of like a loser. Um, and so they go to their phone and then they scroll and then they scroll and they're feeling worse. So they need kind of more excitement. And so they, it ends up them watching porn them usually masturbating and then feeling pretty, pretty rotten after that, deflated, like I've lost this battle again. So in a situation like that, um, how can somebody start to understand the underlying emotional drivers? Because, you know, our advice is usually to start kind of reverse engineering, okay, start like, okay, what was the emotion you were feeling that caused you to reach out for your phone? But I feel like what you're suggesting is even like a layer deeper than that, which is understanding the what was the emotion comprised of kind of thing. Where was it in your body and what was it telling you and stuff like that? Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I think it's important that like any kind of addictive behavior, whether that's porn or overeating or just chronic overworking, <clears throat> every addiction isn't a problem it's a solution to an old problem and to understand what that old problem is the process of understanding i think what, what, you're, what you're saying is that you help them to understand what's the, the original emotion and i would say that understanding to take it one step further is that in order to understand i must feel what that underlying process is in my body so <clears throat> when I feel overwhelmed, when I feel like a loser, what is that like in my body? Like when I say, so oh, how do they do that? They just have to Usually sit you need somebody. And... Yeah, the best way to do it is to have somebody to do this with you. So if you have a mentor or a group to explore that in, that's the best way because it, it, someone can also give you feedback because we learn how to, we actually learn to feel ourselves by the way that other people relate to us. Our primary, they actually teach us how to feel ourselves. That's why. Like in the original story with like an angry father and a child, the child is not just scared of their dad. The dad is also teaching that child how to feel and relate to their own anger. So I'm learning that I actually don't properly feel my anger. I learned to feel it as if I don't just feel anger. I feel how everyone in my life has taught me how to relate to anger. So if I have another person there with me, that's, that's great. But if you're just on your own, you can also do this. So 
<clears throat> when I feel overwhelmed or I feel like a loser and I take a minute to breathe because, you know, likely if you're listening to a podcast, at least you're relatively safe. You know, you're not like in any physical danger, even though your body is having a response that feels like there's some kind of danger going on. Like being a loser feels dangerous. And when I say dangerous, doesn't mean life-threatening. It's more like if I'm failing at my life, if I feel like a loser, that like emotionally feels scary. Like I might be rejected from whatever tribe I was in. Those are like strong biological responses. They're not, they're not problems. Those are like intelligent survival responses. But then to ask like, when I feel like a loser, what's like, what's the temperature of your body? How's your heartbeat doing in that moment? Where do you, when you say you feel like a loser, what's that like in your face and in your back? Can you even feel that in your face or your back or your emotions? Because maybe I actually, I feel that most of my sensations are turned off. So I'm numb, maybe. And numbness is great. Numbness is like, oh, I feel that I can't feel anything. But most people kind of skip over that. They try to get to the feeling. Okay, I try to, I've got to find out what I'm feeling. Numbness is a feeling. <clears throat> and how do I know that I feel, I can't feel anything? Because I, I feel that I can't feel. That so still counts. And then the next thing is to be able to stay there with that feeling. And that's what retrains your nervous system. That's the that's already the interruption to the pattern. Could you could you get into that? <clears throat> yeah. So once I'm, you know, let's say we take the word loser, and I would normally say, so when you peel off the language loser, what are the body sensations that give you that word? What are the emotion and body sensations that, that represent that word inside of your body? And then as you feel those body sensations and emotions that are there, including it might be numbness, what starts happening inside of you just by feeling them? Because normally what happens is they start to relax and start to flow through their body more. <clears throat> and once there's a bit of a movement, I mean, they're not just like stuck in a frozen emotion, like stuck with a sadness, maybe tense shoulders, heaviness in the face, it actually starts to move. And so emotions and sensations don't stay there. They will move if they have proper attention. Like people think that a healthy nervous system is a calm nervous system. That's not true. A healthy nervous system is an accurate and precise nervous system. It's like a flexible, a flexible nervous system is what's healthy, not a calm one. Meaning that when we have an experience, like we feel overwhelmed or we feel like we're a loser, we can feel that and ride it through its full waiver process in our body and return back to homeostasis. Mm -hmm. But if I can't do that, like it gets overwhelmed and I start to feel like a loser and those sensations are, that it feels like it's too strong and I can't stay with it, then I have to do something to avoid feeling that sensation. And so I might kick it into the next stage. Now I don't just feel like a loser. Now I start to feel depressed. <clears throat> so there's increased heaviness. Now I have like a mental brain fog and I just feel like I can't do anything. And I want to change my state more, increase the like, de help desensitize myself a bit more. So maybe I eat something like I just start snacking. And then that helps to increase my glucose levels in my bloodstream. And then that helps me even more to like not feel maybe the chronic overwhelm or fear that was there in the first place. And, but it still doesn't really work because now the, since I'm still not wanting to feel it all the way through, my body has to escalate to another stage. So now I have these like running thoughts in addition to my body sensations that are going through. Like I start to feel like, man, I'm not doing a good job of my work. I can't believe this is happening right now. Also can't, things aren't going as well in my family. And so now I have these thoughts that are symptoms of the tension in my body already. It's, a, it's, more, it's not that the, the thoughts are an issue. The thoughts are like windmill being turned. And it's, a, it's like there's already too much energy in your body emotionally. And so your mind has kicked on like a computer fan to cool off the emotions. And that's what over, overthinking is. It's like your brain joining into the fun to help you regulate your emotions that are too overwhelming already. And so now we have both going on. It's like the computer fan is burning hot and you're having these incessant thoughts and we still don't want to feel what's going on in the body. And now our snacks aren't working. And so we have to escalate to some other kind of behavior to help calm the mind. And so that's where addictive behaviors come in. So whether that's going to be like start compulsively shopping or I watch porn and I masturbate or 
I engage in some kind of like workaholism that will kind of help my nervous system flood and then collapse. And then I kind of return to like some kind of form of stasis again. Or so give me, give <laughs> I just me another feel metaphor. Like, yeah. Yeah. I would love another metaphor for so when you're when you're it's like the emotion wants to be felt, but you keep on burying it in other experiences uh to run away from that emotion because it's too much to deal with um like i just need it a little bit more i guess linear <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm a simple man mm -hmm. david yeah 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 no problem um i think an easy way to think of it is if i st like when i feel like a loser usually that's sadness and fear okay and if i was a child and no one let me feel sad and afraid like they said, stop crying, <laughs> you know, stop crying. And so that means I learned to just not feel sad or scared. And then okay. now as an adult, life is difficult sometimes. Like life, you know, sucks a good amount of the time. Like there's a lot of stress in life. Um, and so I encounter those kind of experiences and I, I get sad and afraid again. And since no one helped me or taught me how to just feel sad and feel afraid as a temporary human experience, I don't get sad and afraid. I cascade into this whole chain of behaviors to try to solve the sadness of fear. And so when you're starting to feel sad, you just preoccupy yourself with other stuff as a, as a way of avoidance, like uh, unconsciously, like, you know, uh, I feel sadness creeping in and I, and so I just like, uh, you know, busy myself. I go clean up the house or I go, and then just like, uh, just do something to be static so that I don't have to sit with this feeling. Is that, mm -hmm. is that what you, yeah. Yeah. And that's usually like second or third stage. So inside the nervous system, let's say again, like with the boy and the dad who said, like, don't get, don't get angry. Let's say they said, stop crying, quit being sad or quit being scared. So that means when the dad says, stop it, what happens in my body? I might notice that I contract a little bit on myself. I kind of shrink in, maybe my stomach tightens. And then I kind of freeze up a little bit and then I start thinking and that all happens maybe in three seconds. It's very quick. And then I start maybe doing some kind of behavior that worked for me. So I start compulsively cleaning up the house or maybe I start being really nice to people all of a sudden. And then I start building on whatever behaviors all to help me not feel sad or scared. Why? Because if I felt sad or scared, dad would get mad. Or they would say, stop crying. Because I, you know, maybe my maybe my parents are wanting to communicate or my caregivers wanting to communicate that, like, um, good children stay strong. But maybe what I ended up internalizing is that, like, scared kids don't get loved. And as a child, I need to attach to my parents. And so I'm going to internalize that pattern. And as I, that pattern becomes sexualized after puberty. And so that adds, like, a whole other layer of... Mm. Um, complications to that pattern when i was a child you know before i before i go through puberty i still have the same kind of pattern but maybe i just do it in different behaviors so you know i just kind of avoid feeling sad or scared and whenever i do maybe i just go hide by myself but then as i go through puberty i get sexualized and it adds a whole other energy to the same patterns i've learned in my nervous system um, but they can be retrained they can all be retrained just like a muscle so I, I learned how to feel sad and sadness maybe only lasts five minutes for me of just having a very sad, scary five minutes versus a whole hour or two hour streak that ends in porn masturbation and then collapsing and then having to restart again the next day. And maybe not, it's still not actually feeling the sadness or fear, but I've just successfully numbed it and suppressed it. And so again, the, the idea is a healthy nervous system has a lot of flexibility and a lot higher like a bigger spectrum of emotions that it can feel so i can feel more sadness and fear in my body which is very different from expressing it it's just that i can feel those sensations along my information highway called the nervous system and it doesn't fry the wiring so to speak so i just have like you know, maybe like a more intense fear intense sadness and then it passes through and then i you know 
finish taking care of my kids or I do my homework or I go back to work. Hey, just a quick interruption to tell you about the 40 day high noon challenge. If you're trying to find a way to start living a high noon life today with no shadows and create a radiant blessing, then this simple challenge is for you. We will send you daily lessons from our team that will keep you motivated on your journey. It's totally free guys, and you'll get constant content directly to you. Just sign up today at highnoon.org slash challenge. That is highnoon.org slash challenge. All right, back to the show. And so when you're doing this kind of work, let's say somebody starts doing practicing this, they uh, either by themselves or with somebody else who helps them feel these emotions. What does a healthy nervous system look like? Um, do you... Let's say sadness creeps in, something happened in your life, you're feeling pretty sad. Uh, you just say, hey guys, I need to, let's say you have a family or you live with your buddies or whatever and you're feeling sad. You're like, hey guys, feeling a little bit sad. I just want to go feel my feelings and I'll come back. Is that like, is that, I'm just trying to think of like uh, a vision of what, what would be an ideal uh, relationship with your nervous system. Right. I mean, it, it takes time to like rebuild the relationship with your nervous system. So I think it's important to get it. It's, it's like retraining a muscle and exercising it. So you're not going to like go from day into to night like that. So yeah, it can look like that. Like for like the busy mom or dad who has a bunch of kids around and all of a sudden you notice, oh, I'm, I'm really upset right now. or I'm really scared, you know? And sometimes what I would do is like, why don't you just go to the bathroom? Like go to, go to the bathroom for a few minutes and you just sit there and you, breathe and feel what's there and it's important that the main thing i'm doing is respecting my own emotional response it's not i don't want to feel sad and afraid anymore i don't want to feel sad that's the problem in the first place is you not wanting to feel sad and afraid um so i go there i respect oh i'm sad and afraid like let's let's get curious about this and you can maybe have a mindfulness practice or different things that you know that help to kind of like soothe your body and you give yourself three minutes and you go back into i don't know the chaotic ruskus of like dinner prep or like trying to get everyone off to school in the morning. So I think that's one way it looks like in daily practice. And also it's good at least every week to have like a bit of dojo time where you can really retrain your system. It's like going to the gym. So, you know, you exercise throughout your life when you're picking up things and lifting up children or going to work, you use your body during the day, but you still go to the gym to really intentionally work out. It's the same for your nervous system. So like whether that's having a mindfulness practice a meditation practice a yoga practice or if you have like a a somatic therapist who can help to train you in those kind of ways um, it's good to have some dojo time or some gym time where you're really mm -hmm. exercising that muscle group and that's what makes it easier when if when you're in in daily life and things are hot like oh I'm, i just got <laughs> <clears throat> yeah yeah well that so my wife and i were talking about this today or yesterday i forget um that I remember very clearly a time in my life when I noticed that I was running really hot and I was spazzing out more because life was just coming in. There's like too much life coming into too small a hole it was, and I couldn't process it all. And I felt like I was going to burst. And because of that, I was short with the kids and then I'd feel so guilty. And uh, this is this is seven years ago or something like that. And I was doing high noon work and, it, you know, but it was just like so much. And then I just felt like there's no way that I can try my way out of this. I have to change something internally. So that's, that began my kind of meditation journey. And I distinctly remember after a few weeks, morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, not wanting to do it, but doing it anyway, because I just knew that, Something I had to change was uh, just the difference was my nervous system, I could feel it, things passed through me. It felt like somebody else's, when your nervous system is really frazzled and overwhelmed, other people's emotions cling to you. Their negative emotions cling to you. Like somebody else's, like your little kid, they have a tantrum and then it, it, it becomes your tantrum and now you're both tantruming together because you just... Too much inputs like i can't take it you know that feeling so 
then after just working on it for a while, just by letting, like allowing myself to feel easeful, practicing ease, then those things would go through me. They wouldn't stick to me. I'd, I'd be present to it, but I wouldn't be reactive to it because it just seemed like I had more bandwidth. And I like that you kind of alluded to it, but it uh, it's kind of like getting a higher wattage or higher voltage kind of uh, system in your house so that you could produce more power for all the different electrical stuff in your house. And that's what it is to kind of, I guess, do this work is to give yourself more bandwidth to process life, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Bandwidth is a great word. Like a healthy nervous system has higher bandwidth. It isn't one that's always relaxed. If I'm always trying to be relaxed, I might have actually very low bandwidth for stress <laughs> or for fear yeah, or angry. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes there's a lot of people, especially like people who are, you know, maybe doing like more like alternative spirituality or more different like meditative practices and they're kind of looking like they're always calm. But that can also just mean that I avoid certain feelings all the time and try to be in this space. And then whenever they happen, I still don't have the bandwidth anyway. Yeah. When as long reacting. as I have my crystals in my house with my cats, I'm zen. <laughs> and the second right. somebody buds in line at Sprouts, ah, watch out, man. Right, exactly. So it's, the idea is like, how much sadness can I feel and still stay with myself? Hmm. How much anger can I feel and still stay with myself? And that's really like the, I mean, that takes practice. So, you know, and that's why... And some of the practice, honestly, we can't do alone. So there's only a certain, there's only this, so much that solo practice and meditation and being and doing this on your work alone can can help you with. Mm. Because um, honestly, like a lot of the, it's not just fear or sadness or anger, the emotion that's happening with us. It's also that that base pattern that we learn for whatever emotional pattern that we have that we call stress or a trauma response or nervous system response was because there was like somebody there. There's like a relationship happening. So like my dad scared me and it, it's actually having another human being in the room that was intertwined with me feeling scared. And so even though I might, pra I can do a lot of work on my own, which I think is necessary to work on my fear and my sadness. So when I feel afraid and, sc and scared and sad, I can do that. That's great. But then I might find myself that's when I feel s afraid and scared and there's somebody else there is making me feel afraid and scared it's like all of my stuff goes out the door anyway and so like we call it like relational contact to be able to practice regulating your fear and sadness in the presence of another human being is critical to this process that's what a good meditate mindfulness teacher will do that's what a good therapist would do is that you can feel angry in the presence of another human being or you can feel sad in the presence of another human being and retrain your nervous system to know that, to know that that is okay. It's okay that I, that there's another human being present and I'm feeling intensely angry. Or I'm feeling intensely mm -hmm. sad. And most people, we don't get that experience because we try to do our spiritual practice on our own, or we try to do our meditation practice on our own and try to handle it by myself. But oftentimes the, the question people ask me, what are better ways I can do this on my own? Yes, there's A, B, C, and D. And also, is there a fear of relationship, like feeling this emotion with another human being that's there? Mm. And so that's yeah. why, yeah, that's why having like a somatic therapist, not just like, cause it's important to understand that in, in mainstream therapy, um, trauma and nervous system response isn't necessarily understood mainstream. Most of the time these responses are looked at as if they're problems that need to be treated when they're not problems at all. They're just learned patterns that need to heal. And they're actually successful patterns. Like that's why when I feel sad, the answer is not to get rid of my sadness. It's to respect it. Let us finish this course. And you know, it's good data. What are you sad about? Learn mm -hmm. that teaches you about yourself versus you have some kind of clinical illness that you need to get rid of. That's just only going <laughs> to exacerbate your situation more. Yeah. That's so, <laughs> I, is that because therapy typically views the everything as separate rather than an integrated whole? Like that's the kind of Western perspective. Is like right, 
It's like, I mean, clinical psychiatry is coming out of medicine. So the idea is that there is an illness or there's a problem or something foreign or something wrong happening with the overall system. And if you get rid of the thing that's wrong, then the system will be okay, you know? And so we extrapolate that to our emotional mental world, but you would never say, oh, I wish I could get rid of my liver, you know, or I wish I could get rid of my lungs. You know, but we do the same thing with our sadness. Like, I wish I could get rid of this sadness. But we're, the sadness is you. That's your, that's your, that's you. You know, it's just as important to your functioning as your liver, you know, or your eyes. And so even the same thing, like with an, like an illness, like you have a fever, that's your body going through a process to deal with the response in the environment. That's not, you know, I don't want to get rid of my fever. I want to listen to what this process is and make sure that, I, you know, it doesn't hurt me. But it's important to relearn to respect the intelligence of what's happening inside of us. So we don't have quote unquote problems or psychoses. We have, we learn about our own patterns that we've learned and how those have protected us in the past or how those are solutions to something in the past. And I can learn from that, digest that, and then respect it when it comes. And I can be here. That's why, um, and it's like why, uh, it's been proven that Holocaust survivors and the descendants of Holocaust survivors have higher levels of anxiety um, and maybe like chronic anxiety, but they're also a bit uh, more aware of their environment. So they actually process more data quickly and take in more visual stimulus. And, you know, you're actually more prepared for something like that to happen again. That's actually passed down. And so it's important that we respect our emotional responses. You know, that's why I say addictions aren't problems. They're just solutions to old problems there. I mean, we need to respect, oh, what is my body trying to solve right now and respect that and make sure that it's not about, you know, my body's not trying to solve feeling like a loser. It's trying to solve maybe fear and anxiety with my dad or fear and, and being sad with growing up or with failing in school. Um, and I failing think... at school. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> How would you even mention yeah. that? I think another important thing is to get that we, that this is not normal life. Like we live in a world as if like, oh, I, I need to be okay. And someone who doesn't have these issues, but we live in a traumatized world. This is not a normal world. Like we were born into a world that is living in the aftermath of war, famine, abuse, racism, systemic oppression, for millennia we've been hurting each other for millennia and this is where we come from so this most of that stuff is not digested like most people say we don't even talk about vietnam or world war ii you know and mm -hmm. that's just a couple of generations ago and that has influenced our parenting but it's also like in our genes like we're living in a traumatized world this is not normal life this is life that's hurt and so we think that, oh, why do I have these issues or why do I have these things going on versus I think zooming out and realizing, no, we're, we're part of this world. We're not trying to like, oh, live a good life in the middle of a, of a traumatized world. We're a part of this world and our own healing contributes to the healing of the entire planet and our whole species. And sometimes people are really hard on themselves as if they should be like clean in a dirty world. And it's like, no, like, no, you get, get dirty and get muddy. We're a part of this life. We're part of this world. No. And we are a part of the global restoration process and your own individual healing benefits much more than just you. <clears throat> That's and true. having the symptoms in the first place is not because there's something wrong with you. You were born into a system. We're born into this world and actually owning our sadness or fear is a part of participating in this world, in this life. Yeah. Great. Um, how, let's say that there's, uh, somebody who ha is, is really in, in not a great place. There's a mosquito trying to attack me. Um, and they're, they're does their nervous system, like somebody who's always anxious and they're, all, and they're around you, are you, are, is your nervous system picking up on their anxiety? Do you inherit uh, other people's nervous system or can you influence their nervous system like if that person is anxious to help make them less anxious or uh, does it does it matter I guess your bandwidth whether you can influence other people or because it's 
it seems akin to um, our nervous systems are almost like the physical manifestation of our spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So that because you can spiritually sense certain things about other people if you're in tune with your spirit. Similarly, you can uh, sense certain things through your physical body uh, if you speak the language of your body. So how important is it to hang out with people with who have worked on their own nervous systems? And what do you do if you're in the, the mix with people who are really impacting you? Because I'm sure there's people listening who have a spouse that's always stressed out. And I can think of a few. Uh, who, and that impacts them. And they're like, oh, because she's always like this. Like, what does that person do if they feel okay except when this stressed out person gives them their stress? Right. I think this is an important thing that comes up a lot, even in like my work when I'm like, if I'm working with other therapists or I'm training other coaches, it's like, how do I, what do I deal when like people's toxic energy gets on me? And how do I like, should I spend less time with those people? Or what if I'm married to that person? Then what do I do? <laughs> I got yeah and I just to point out that that is that we see that society manages that at least in the west not here out in the east yet I don't know that it will but in the west it's like the microaggression kind of cult of mm -hmm. I feel like like you're like you're you might want to say something negative in the future about me therefore I need to excommunicate you from my life and be in this safe space where nothing bad can happen. So you're living in a smaller and smaller world. That's one kind of extreme reaction to it. But there's also, you know, a lot of people who believe that because you're this way, I can't be around you. So if that's marriage, then that's divorce. If it's parents and children, then it's like, you know, I just can't talk to you anymore, mom and dad, because you're so dysfunctional, this kind of thing. So I feel like, to be honest, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like in the West right now, the prescribed solution is to just cut, sever any relationship that might in any way be toxic. And it seems pretty extreme to me because there's no resolution and restoration like you're saying. But that seems to be the kind of overwhelming sentiment is like, oh, you're bad for me. And it, even like in friends, like on Facebook, someone's like, oh, I had a friend and they were mean, so I don't talk to them anymore. And then everybody's like, yeah, you go, you got to take care of yourself. And it seems like, okay, it's good to protect yourself. But it also seems like there's a lack of growth there, you know? But you also right. don't want to expose yourself to too much toxicity because... <clears throat> that could drown you so i'm just i guess the question is more like how much do you take and how much do you have to preserve yourself and how much can you even influence because there's other people who like i i can i can manage it that person might be a raging alcoholic it's like i'll save them i'll save them but little do they know they're also being taken down that road with them because they don't have the strength to actually help so like mm -hmm. how much do you endure of this toxicity <clears throat> yeah yeah, I, I think it's it's worth looking at. And when I'm working with someone, my belief is when a person when a, a person says, "I can't be around this person's anxiety," and I would say, "Well, what's really happening inside your nervous system when you're around this person? Because is it that you, their anxiety is difficult for you to be around, or that their anxiety?" triggers an anxiety that already is in your body that you just don't notice except when you're around that person and you are having difficulty being with your own anxiety that surfaces <laughs> while you're in contact with that person. Such a great question. Because, you know, if there was no initial anxiety in my body that I haven't dealt with or looked mm -hmm. at before, then when I come to another anxious person, it's almost like a tuning fork. Anxiety walks into the room like a tuning fork and it's like vibrating. And if there's no corresponding anxiety in my own body to start vibrating with their tuning fork, nothing happens to me. But if I have my own undigested fear and then someone with chronic anxiety walks in, they start to activate my own anxiety. They touch something that is already pre-existing inside of my body. Mm. They didn't get anything on me. 
if there's nothing inside me already, there's nothing to get on me. Like if I go into a session with someone and they have chronic anxiety, but I'm not, I don't have the same type of fear inside of myself, nothing happens to me. Like I, I feel them while they're with me, but then when they're gone, I don't feel it anymore. You know, it doesn't, there's not like a residue versus like if there's something inside of me, like I have some chronic anxiety with my parents or something about in school, then even after I've related to that person, had that anxious conversation, I'm still having that conversation with them, even though they're gone now. And I can make up the kind of the story that I think is less mature and say, well, that person got something on me. They left their toxicity on me. I have to deal with all of that. Or I can say, oh, this person has actually given me something to look at inside of myself that I'm not fully feeling. And if I process that and learn how to be with that, then the next time I'm with that person, it's actually, it's okay. I feel, I do feel like their anxiety and maybe there's a bit of stress, but it doesn't linger. There's no residue. And so I think it's important for the, I, my belief in working with trauma and working with a lot of kind of people in the helping profession um, is that, yeah, is it that that person is making you anxious or that that person is touching a pre-existing anxiety in you already? Hmm. And, it, and it's not that I can't be with that anxiety, be with their anxiety. I actually can't be with mine. And so yes. then I want to, restructure my life so that I never have to be in situations that trigger my own anxiety again. Which lends so, credence to the idea that let's say, let's say it's a couple because I do know a few of these where um, one spouse will say often, Oh, my, my, my wife is always like this or my husband's always like this and they make me crazy because of blah, blah, blah. Um, does it, does it then give power to the idea that if you really work on yourself and digest your own stuff that's being triggered by the, like, let's say specifically anxiety. Okay. My spouse, their anxiety makes me anxious. So in fact, mm -hmm. you need to work on your own anxiety first. And once you can digest that, you can be around them without picking up on it. And you can actually then be a source of potential help for them like a, a bit more of a rock rather than engaging at the same level like that tuning fork analogy right so i can actually be responsive to their anxiety hmm. you know because i'm not dealing with my own i'm actually just with theirs if i <laughs> still have my own anxiety that i'm not dealing with i'm not even relating to them anymore i'm just relating to my own anxiety that stemmed from my past and then i'm reacting to them from my own anxiety whoa 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 so you're saying that a couple that is fighting with each other is not fighting against each other. They're just fighting within themselves at each other. Right. And usually like there's a couple, like both couples are basically mm -hmm. saying, I feel so much anxiety in my body that I can't be with. And then saying, yeah, me too. Your anxiety is triggering all this anxiety that I can't be with either. And so I need you to help me be with my own anxiety. And then you have two people with barely any capacity to be with their own anxiety and then trying to force each other to help them be with their anxiety and the, a lot of the issues in the relationship have very little to do with the relationship. It's just a lack of capacity in that two person system, which is why most couples need a community. Mm. That's why relationship is actually like the most healing mechanism for human beings is other attuned people. It's relationship. Like we're wounded in relationship and we're healed in relationship. And the, most of the issues that come up in couples, we think, Oh, it's an issue with the relationship or an issue with one person, the other person. It's usually a capacity issue and a lack of community. But we live in a society where we think that we're supposed to be these functioning nuclear families that can handle it all on our own. When actually we need five, six, seven, ten people around us for each spouse. And we also need like one generation, two generations of healthy, mature elders to help me feel this anxiety. So it spreads out a little bit, but two, two human newer systems, that's a lot of data flowing through them. It's a strong charge, but then you add other people. It's like you add more RAM to the computer and then all of a sudden you can process that anxiety and digest it, which is usually from the past. And then the couple can actually talk about whatever is the present issue, which is usually not such a big deal. And, and of course I'm speaking of, you know, normal couple interaction, I'm not talking about like violent, violent or abusive relationships obviously then that's mm. that's a different it's a different situation yeah um that's incredible no that's really encouraging um it's it's really 
like that analogy of uh, drummers drumming. Like if you have a bunch of people drumming different beats and it's very arrhythmic, but eventually they'll start to kind of fall into the same rhythm, right? And mm -hmm. if you're in a community and you're beating at a good rhythm, and then let's say that your couple is out of sync and they stop beating in the right rhythm, you need to then remember what it's like to be in the right rhythm by connecting with them and they help you get back into the flow of things uh, by reminding you of uh, who you who you want to be rather than and feeling the good feelings right like uh, uh, when you're fighting as a couple or let's say like a single person when you're fighting with your environment if it's your parents or if it's just life itself um, it's I think you were saying this in the beginning. You can't think your way out of those situations. You have to kind of experience, let your nervous system kind of process whatever you're feeling, but then also to help you remember what it's like to feel good. It's like to hang out with people who feel good. You can kind of inherit that. Just like the anxiety is stimulated in, like somebody else's anxiety is stimulated in you if you have anxiety in you. I'm sure the the opposite is true as well. Like if you have happiness in you, somebody else's happiness is then contagious in you. And then you can kind of let their fire ignite in you a little bit, or they can just kind of help you ignite your own flame. Something like right, that. Exactly. And so like, it's, we call it like it's, you're able to, you know, really be around supportive community. Like we need that as a resource in our lives. Mm. And, you know, it's like the opposite story of like the dad who wouldn't let me feel scared or angry. is said, stop crying. But well, what if there's like the father who says, Oh, I, I see that you're scared. Come to me. And it's actually through that relationship that I realized, oh, the fear that I thought was overwhelming as a child, I now feel my dad is emotionally connected to me and feeling me. And the fear digests through that relationship. And I learn that I can be scared and it will be okay. And that because I learned that this relationship will be okay. That's like called co-regulating. I, I, I learned that I don't have to resist this emotion, that it can actually flow here. Mm. And it's the same inside of a couple. You know, when a couple feel like there's so much fear or anxiety in the relational context in both of their individual nervous systems, but then they have an elder or maybe five elders or like friends, like I see you're really scared or you're really angry and you come to me. And then slowly their, their couples, I call it a two person nervous system, starts to downregulate mm -hmm. and they calm down and they digest and they realize, oh yeah, I'm, the fear is not life-threatening, it's okay. And they can relax and calm down. And then they can see if there is actually any issue between the couple. Oftentimes it's very minute, like, oh, please put the toilet seat back down. Or, you know, I would just, could you apologize for that thing that happened? That was, that, that was, that was kind of hurtful. But most of like the anxiety that's coming up in, in, in most couples is just a replay of the same wounding they had from their parents. It's the only other time I'm going to have a relationship that's as intimate as I was with my parents. And so just like I said earlier, how <clears throat> we need a relationship to, um, we need to practice feeling our fear in the presence of another human being. The opposite is also true that there are certain types of deep, seated fears and angers that will only come up when someone is very, very close to us. Mm. Because as a child, we learned, oh, some of the data that my nervous system took in was not just I'm scared. It's also that I was close to someone. I was very, very close to another adult. I actually was attached to them. And I mm. learned that, oh, any relationship where I'm very attached means that this is how I relate to fear or this is how I relate to anger. And so I could be like a totally healthy functioning person in day-to-day -day life. But then once I find some kind of a partner or someone who's close to that I start attaching to, all of these old attachment patterns come up about how I relate to fear and anger now. And so that's why having uh, your spouse is one of the best opportunities to heal things if I can recognize that my spouse is touching things inside of me that are pre-existing that I brought here, that I'm only, even though I didn't feel them in my life before, I'm only going to feel them now. And then I can bring those into another context, like with a good somatic couples therapist or a good meditation teacher or in my spiritual practice to like, it, it's, it's, it's like, you know, free therapy. Your spouse gives you like, like a <laughs> shines a flashlight on the, on the parts of you that can be looked at because they say, Oh, I, I feel like my spouse may be really anxious. And they say, well, that means that there's something inside me already. Let's go take a look at that. 
Mm. And then if each partner is doing that, they're actually just the relationship can actually evolve because just like you have every person's soul wants to become their truest self is like an evolutionary impulse to become something in this world. Every relationship also wants to become something. There's an impulse in every every committed relationship. And if there's like stagnation because we like have some unprocessed fear or anger from our past, that evolutionary impulse is going to push on that stagnation and it's going to cause that relationship to either deal with that stagnation or it's going to rupture it again, you know, and cause some kind of break or be in a crisis. And it's actually an opportunity to look at, look at that process and yeah, but the response is not, oh, the couple needs to do stuff, but it's actually the response is that we need more community around this couple. I think especially in the West, we're so individualized and so hyper-focused on the individual yeah. and so like localized. We think, oh, even the way we deal with sickness, we think, oh, the problem is in your liver. We think it has nothing to do with the rest of your life. Most of the problems that we experience in our life are because of the absence of a tuned, connected community around us. Most of the issues can be attributed to that. We don't have three generations of elders who are mature and have been through life and can really listen and be with us and spiritually guide us and friends who are with us and understand us and younger people who are mentoring and learning and taking care of. We're missing that. We're living in a tattered fabric of a community and the community that we do have often is traumatized itself. And we, but we don't even notice that because everyone's in that. And so we think that whatever problem is happening, it has to do with me or my family mm. when we, <clears throat> well, I think it's important, um, particularly in Western society, that we notice that we are we're relationally and spiritually impoverished. Um, like people used to use the terms like the developing world, and they're economically impoverished, and they don't have enough food or water. But if you were to like turn on your spiritual eyes and look at our society, we're just as starved. Where it's actually it's actually like uh, agonizing to think about the level of uh absence and the yeah. lack of need that that's being the lack of our needs being met as human beings spiritually for community for connection for intimacy for wisdom for elders in our community like most of the elders are shipped away where <laughs> we're it's like if you were to look at us we would look like we were starving and you could see our spiritual rib cage because we have such little nourishment and then on top of that we just add a bunch of self-blame to our issues and say like if i'm a loser it's my fault or if there's something mm -hmm. happening in my couple, it's my fault. It's like we're, it's really, um, yeah, it's sad. Yeah. I just was uh, at a local family's house tonight out here. And we were talking about that, the fact that out here in Vietnam in particular, they have a lot of three generation households. And he's like, oh, I, actually there's quite a few four generation households. And, you know, you see them up and down the street and there's, it's funny because they don't have nearly as much personal space in these homes because there's a lot of people in these homes. They're bigger, bigger homes. But um, in America, the dream is to have a palace with nobody living in it, which is probably the saddest dream. We need a giant, you know, mansion and just have maybe one kid you know, maybe a dog and like, good God, think about that. Think about the imagery that we're sold at the quintessence of, of such being like the Kardashians where each of them have their own palace, right? And none of them have families or big families or anything like that. And that's, that's what we're dying to have. And it's the most miserable kind of vision that you could, you could ever want because there's so much internal stuff lacking. But I also want to give a shout out to, you know, Benji and I, I was feeling a little bit strange about where we're at at high noon. I just know we could do more and be more. And I saw some kind of single people, not single people, but like guys, coaches who help people with porn addiction. And I saw how effective they could be just as a one man show. And it's like, oh man, like, look what they're doing. They're just one person. We have a, big staff, big volunteer base, and like, could we be doing more? But what we're doing that nobody else is really doing is creating a genuine sense of family, worldwide family, uh, because of True Parents, right? Because they created this foundation of a family and we're just leveraging that family to actually 
do that stuff that we're talking about. And we do have multiple generations, but they kind of do stick with their own group. But it's the beginning. It's like uh, scratching a, a cosmic itch. Of course, we're just in the early phase of this, but that's just naturally what happened that we're, we've formed a community, not, not on purpose, but that seems to be the strongest part of who we are. And it just seems to be a, a massive um, need that everybody has, but nobody knows that they have, it, especially, no, I'd say everywhere. Because even out here, people live together, but they're not really connected like, like we could. And they're all traumatized. It's, you know, anyway, so I love that. <laughs> I love that because what you're talking about, then think about this. I'm sure you have, but everybody else who's not a nerd like us. The idea mm -hmm. that we have a nervous system. And then you mentioned that a couple could then have a nervous system that they create together. But then I'm mm -hmm. sure one level next is family, that a family has a real nervous system, and then a community. A community have a, has a nervous system and that genuinely if one person's struggling, then the whole community really feels it. And that's a healthy community, right? That you're right. not doing it out of religious obligation or or anything, but you really want to help each other because that's who you are as a community. And that's, that's, that's beautiful. Right. And my, my belief is that, <clears throat> you know, we think that we're walking separately around, but actually our nervous systems are all interconnected, you know, even though we, we're across the globe, but our nervous systems mm -hmm. are having a party right now. And so we think that like, you know, <clears throat> And even with the planet too, like when a person is walking through a forest, I'd say when you're walking through the woods or a forest, where is nature? And I say, well, nature's around me, but I say, well, nature's also through you too. You know, I am part of nature. I'm not just walking on the planet. I am the planet. And also like, where is society? Where is, huma where is humanity? Is humanity around you or society around you or society through you? Hmm. And I think we, we walk with such like a deep embedded sense of separateness that it's almost like assumed as a truth of our society. And we build many like even philosophies and systems on that assumption. But we are one living, breathing ecosystem and nervous system. And isn't just this isn't just a metaphor. It's also the science is starting to show that, that like you actually share one microbiome or when you're with your spouse, your immune systems are interlinked. Your microbiomes are interlinked. Your heart rate variability is interlinked. Your brain wave function is interlinked. Same thing with your children. It's also cities have certain interlinked frequencies in, in the way that they interact with each other. We are literally interconnected to each other and to the planet that we live on. There's really just one planet. There's just one of them. We're just slowly, slowly waking up. <clears throat> Made of something that's both new and ancient, I would say that we are all here and we're starting to become more and more present to the the parts of ourselves that we've identified with that we think are separated that we have a sense that they're separated from and uh, and it's true it doesn't mean like just having community is the answer to everything it's like having an attuned community because community just like you know a traumatizing relationship with emotionally abusive parents that's is a, that is a community but that's also like a misattuned community and it's the same <laughs> thing we can experience a lot of our deepest wounds um yeah. in community so and they were also trying to grow up, but I, I love, there was something from, a, gosh, what was her name? She wrote, wrote a, a book. Um, was it Where's Waldo? That was a good book. <laughs> no, it's a, I think it's Raina Cohen. She, she, she speaks about how I would, I would rather have the problems that come from connection and community than have the problems that come from the absence of connection and community. Hmm. And so it's like, yeah, relationships take work. Relationship with yourself takes, takes work. But compared to the benefits and the fruits that having an attuned relationship gives to your life, it's, it's like completely incomparable. It's like for the 10% of the effort that it takes to maintain a relationship with yourself and a relationship with the people around you, the fruits that that can give you are like immeasurable. Like it, it can resource mm -hmm. you in so many, many different ways. And I think because, you know, our, our greatest, people say our greatest fear and our greatest longing is connection and intimacy. We oftentimes err on the side of like, well, I just don't want to be any, I don't want to be intimate. Or we flip to the other side and we're completely engrossed in other people and we like 
follow them around emotionally and completely. And then as soon as they change, we feel like something is wrong. And so it's like learning how to just be related is very important. Mm. And the first relationship that we have is with ourselves and how we relate to ourselves. And I believe also with the divine, with that like vertical connection, we learn the loyalty to that. And then we learn how to be related to each other horizontally in the world. <clears throat> so, I like but yeah, it, relationship is like the most is the, is the deepest healing mechanism and is also our source of greatest wounding and so that's why yeah, yeah high risk high reward but mm-hmm. so you know I want to just I guess start summarizing that you know if somebody is a young single person, um, what you're suggesting is that they do some work by themselves, do that the exercises that you're talking about, meditation, learning about your emotions, things like that, but also as much as possible, do it together with somebody that you trust, um, like a mentor you suggested. Um, is that is that apt for? kind of like a takeaway for young single people yeah yeah and like you know i think there's a lot of stigma around it but like find a good therapist if you can afford one or if your health insurance includes it who will can you can be like professionally attuned to you and don't just find any therapist look for like i would say somatic experiencing is one you can look for because not all therapies are the same you can mess yourself up so <laughs> I think look for something called like somatic experiencing or one that I personally enjoy is called NARM, N-A-R-M, stands for like neuroaffective relational, um, neuroaffective relational M. Um, I can't remember what the N in NARM stands for, but I can Manly give it to you for the show notes. Yeah, those are particularly good um, modalities that can help to just take it a bit more refined so that when I feel my anxiety, you can more quickly go to when did you learn this pattern of anxiety and then kind of take you back to that situation and time place in your body and help you kind of feel that fear in that way. And it can kind of streamline your process. So, and again, it's to think of like therapy more like as a coach who will help you to help you live a better future versus like, there's something wrong with me. And that's why I'm in therapy. That's, that's different from, yeah. Cause again, they're not problems. They're just solutions to old problems. So I'd recommend that too. And then do stuff in groups, like go outside, make sure you're eating, you know, make sure you're getting enough sleep. Drink like that take, chai, take care everybody. Of your body. Yeah, drink the chai, take care of your, your body. Like, you know, like you, the first part of taking care of your mind is taking care of your body. First part of like taking care of your thoughts is taking care of your body. Mm. You know, like it's very difficult to think depressing thoughts when your body is feeling great. <laughs> it's it's hard <laughs> it's hard yeah. um and also if, but if you're like sick tired exhausted it's kind of hard to feel to have positive yeah, thoughts so like yeah take take care of your body anytime i've ever had the flu or some type of sickness i remember that's when my mind would like circle me with dark thoughts and just start kicking me all day <laughs> like i never am a really dark person but if i was ever sick it was like oh you're not feeling so great are you <laughs> let's get them boys <laughs> and then they just kick the crap out of them so yeah that's yeah. Very, very true it's a lot easier to feel sorry for yourself lament your life resent the world when you're not feeling well um, yeah and sure. things that really comfort your body i don't mean like go to the gym and start like going hard because a lot of people say like, i don't i can't get the motivation to do that i just mean like go for a walk like take a bath um, like massage your own feet. Like these mm-hmm. are things, especially for like young guys, like very foreign stuff to just sit and do things that are soothing for your body. Most of them, we don't even know what, what does soothe my body. So all we have is like these other practices. But, like. Yeah. I, di- I didn't know whether to be alarmed or happy, but a bunch, maybe like five years ago, my, my sons really got into bath bombs. And uh, yeah, try it. Figure out what that means, guys. If you don't, if you're young and single, don't know what a bath bomb is. That's blessing prep right there. Um, yeah, I think we're so afraid, you know, of like uh, our own like masculinity. One of the best things I ever saw was, was I was I was li- I was traveling around to Cairo in the Middle East uh, with a few of my friends, and we went to Jordan, 
and I went to a bathhouse in Jordan and these are a bunch of like huge guys, so much hair everywhere, like beards, face and everything. And then like everyone was just so physical with each other, giving each other massage. And we're all like kind of, you know, we're all naked in this bathhouse. And I see this like crowd of like 20 middle-aged men and uh, giving each other massages, singing together. Some dude brought this instrument and they were just having a good time. And there was tea all over the place and people were playing board games, just like laughing. And these are things that are deeply soothing. None of them are like hitting it hard at the gym. They're just taking care of each other and taking care of their bodies. And I think like you would never see like a bunch of baby boomers in America, like a bunch of dudes <laughs> go into a, a bathhouse, be naked together and like just like take care of each other. And I think, you know, particularly for like male bodies, it's so important to, yeah, like learn, learn what actually soothes, soothes you, not just what amps you up, but what soothes you. Shout out uh, to Jilju Bonds in Korea, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Top Gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, David. If if people want to contact you, uh, do you want them to? And if so, how do you recommend they do so? Yeah, yeah. And a great way to, to reach me is at www.beingwholehearted.com. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram. I think I'm like david.jyoung on Instagram. J. Um, Young. That sounds like yeah. your rapper name. <laughs> J. Young. Yeah, man. It's like... It's like another life and uh, or at wholeheartedofficial.com and then you can kind of check out some more of our videos or some of the different resources that we do on this on this topic so yeah sweet um mm -hmm. yeah i think we covered a, a lot of stuff so i want to give people's minds a break uh but thank you for stopping by dear sir uh yeah i always feel like a complete boob talking to you you know your stuff it's great yeah, no, I'm, it's, I just appreciate what you're doing for so many people. Like, I really, yeah, don't just like hanging out with you. I respect you a lot, mm. deeply. Okay, everybody else can leave. David and I are going to do another podcast just for each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Hey, did you know that our team wants to do more events? Well, if you want to bring the High Noon message to your community or group, then let us know and we'll try to work something out. There's a simple application that you can fill out right now at highnoon.org slash invite. And one of our team members will get back to you to see what's possible. That's highnoon.org slash invite. All right, see you in the next episode.